throughout the history of modern warfare, certain systems of categorization have come to prominence that look at the evolution of a system or technology. The most notable is the Generations of War, which looks at eras 1 through maybe 5 that have developed over the last few hundred years. In one of the videos I did about a year ago, I look at similar generational categorizations of fighter jets and tanks. I, however, am not as into these vehicles as some other military historians, and instead I find interest in small arms, especially service rifles. In that same video, which looked at Battlefield 2042, I tried to make my own generational matrix for the evolution of small arms, which is on screen here and which you can learn more about in that video I made, which you can watch here. Since then, however, I have done more research on firearms development and, more importantly, I have actually dedicated more than 20 minutes to thinking about this. So here is my updated generation matrix for service rifle evolution. We'll get more into this and hopefully add depth and answer questions you may have. But first, remember to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for more content. YouTube doesn't like gun videos that much, that's no secret, and me still being a small channel doesn't help at all either. So doing those things will help me out a lot. So firstly, how do I determine categories? My main basis here was actually the jet fighter and tank progressions that are generally used today. The first thing is, these matrices mostly start in or around World War II, as that's when the tech that lays the groundwork for our modern tech generally starts. The first jet fighters start in World War II, so the Matrix starts there, for example. By the same token, assault rifles start in World War II as well, so you can see that Gen 1 here starts with the Germans in World War II. It did pain me a bit to not include a longer history of firearms development, but to make it consistent, I either would have to sacrifice a lot of detail, which would defeat the point of the video, or go into a lot of detail for every era of firearms history, which I won't be doing here. Now, how do I determine when a new generation comes along? This one is a lot harder, and you'll see here that I actually have a two-dimensional matrix to make sense of this. While there aren't necessarily hard lines between the generations, a generation is usually defined by a handful of significant changes from one weapon system to another that become widely used, and generally change the effectiveness of the weapon to the point where the competing militaries usually have to adopt similar systems. An example from tanks would be the introduction of night fighting technology in the 1960s. This tech was impactful enough that most every tank that didn't have night fighting was heavily outclassed, and thus the change was significant and widely used, introducing Generation 2 of tanks. Things get a bit more complex when you have multiple factors, as it raises a question of what gen a weapon system is that has some, but not all of the characteristics. The generations will start when the first of one of these weapon systems is adopted in a major capacity by a military, so the weapon just being invented won't start the generation, and a weapon system only being used in a small scope, such as the special forces or a vehicle crew or something will not count as generational adoption either. This is mostly just to simplify things, as otherwise it would be hard to actually convey the important trends, and it would seem like a generation has started even when that weapon style plays little or no role in military meta. As a quick example, Kalishnikov carbines have been in use for a while, but that doesn't mean that a carbine-centric generation has existed for that long, as the more popular systems even within Russia was something else, namely full-length assault rifles. I have also added lettered auxiliary categories to these generations as they symbolize a significant change in weapon systems that were popular and ran at about the same time as another generation and maintain most of the key characteristics, but since it didn't necessarily proceed or replace that generation but rather competed with it at the same time, I think it should go on a different axis than the linear time frames of the generations. For the end of a generation, I'm going to avoid overlap as the generational dates really denote when this weapon style was the meta or vanguard of employed tech. 
So for example, the generation of the AKM wouldn't last till present even though many militaries still use it. Just understand that at any given time, many if not most countries aren't actually on the newest generation, and many generationed weapons are operating at the same time. That doesn't mean that, say, everyone stopped using the AK in 1964, it just means that the AK was no longer the most advanced or popular wave of rifle. Sounds complicated, but it really isn't, so let's just jump into it finally. Starting this matrix, we actually, and I'm cheating a little bit, and we have Generation Zero, which isn't something the other matrixes do. However, I figured that the weapons in this generation were unique enough from what came before to be on this matrix, even if it isn't officially actually here. Gen Zero consists of semi-automatic rifles of high caliber. These weapons were developed as early as 1885, but weren't adopted until the interwar period, with the US being the first to officially adopt a Gen Zero rifle in 1936 on a large scale, which is where we start the timeline. Using a system that automatically cycled the weapon with siphoned off energy from the previous round, these rifles were capable of much faster firing than the bolt-action rifles that defined warfare before them. This lack of any manual action also allowed the shooter to keep a more consistent sight picture, making follow-up shots more accurate as well as more rapid, even if technically semi-autos are less accurate than bolt guns on a physical level. These guns were also chambered in similar if not identical cartridges to their bolt-action predecessors, as many conventions at the time still considered long-range marksmanship dependent fighting, with powerful ammo as the best way for infantry to engage enemies. Easily the most well-known of these rifles is the M1 Garand, adopted by the US military in 1936 and used to great effect through the Second World War. Chambered in .30-06 and loaded with an 8-round magazine, these were probably the most imposing rifles of the war. The Garand was not the only rifle of this style used during the war, with the SVT-40 being produced by the Soviets and using a similar design, but with the Russian 7.62x5R caliber and a 10-round mag. Other lesser-known rifles, like the American M1941 Johnson, Polish Zor 38M, and various 19th century Austrian Monlicker models would fall into this category as well. Through World War II, Gen Zero rifles ruled the battlefield, even if they were far outshadowed overall by bolt actions. Anyways, as the war went on, some German got the idea that a semi-auto rifle with a slightly smaller round would be better, as they could fire faster and have less recoil, and carry more ammo since they would be shooting more. I was originally going to put a Gen 0.5 here for this gun, the Gewehr 43, but decided against it as it was never fully adopted. Nevertheless, the idea of intermediate cartridges and a semi-auto gun began to evolve. Other examples like the M1 carbine and later the SKS existed during or around the war as well, but the Germans would really develop this idea in 1944 when someone asked, what if we took this, gave it more ammo, and made it into a machine gun sometimes? And the assault rifle was born with the Sturmgewehr 44. The STG-44 fired the 7.92x33mm Kurtz round, the same as the Gewehr, and this cartridge was literally just a cut-down version of the larger round the Germans used in their main battle rifles. This rifle has an interesting relationship with you-know-who, because of YouTube we won't get into it too much, although he was allegedly very opposed to the concept at first, but later fell in love with it and even coined the name Sturmgewehr, which in English translates to assault rifle, which is the term for these types of guns we use today. This starts to bring us into Gen 1, although the STG-44 came too late in the war to actually be adopted, and less than 500,000 were produced. For reference, that's less than how many rifles most countries would make in a year. It's also complex because the gun had earlier versions and was developed technically earlier as a submachine gun, but only one heavily depleted division was ever fully equipped with it. The beginning of Generation 1 weapons, the assault rifle, would really start in 1947. We all know the story here, Mikhail Kalishnikov designs a rifle for the Soviets, which is adopted in 1947 as the AK-47. 
This rifle used a long stroke gas piston system and fired a 762 by 39 mm cartridge from 30 round magazines. Instead of a longer 20 something inch barrel, the AK used a 16.3 inch barrel about the same size as the STG. The gun was select fire and allowed for precision shooting and suppressive capability within 300 or so meters. Like the Americans before them, the Soviets had developed and issued a weapon that really changed the game, and the production of the AK is probably the biggest innovation in firearms tech since the first automatic guns in the late 1800s. Other, lesser known examples of Gen 1 guns would include the French CEAM Model 1950, and of course various Kalashnikov variants like the AKM. The defining characteristics of Gen 1 are A. Select fire capability, B. Intermediate cartridges, often fed in a higher capacity magazine, and C. Often a lighter weight and shorter length than previous rifles. These innovations not only gave far more firepower to the average soldier, but the intermediate cartridge allows to effectively control fire at close range as well as a decent degree of precision at medium and sometimes even longer ranges. The assault rifle married the submachine gun which used pistol ammo for high rates of fire and CQC effectiveness, and the bolt action rifle which allowed for stopping power, range, and accuracy it really was the best of both worlds, and anyone who didn't have one was now behind the ball. NATO countries saw this massive innovation and got on it, but their approach was a bit different, which is where we get into Gen 1A. 1A guns were generally used and produced in Western countries starting in 1953. These Western countries wanted to keep the select fire capability of the Kalashnikov, however, they were still convinced that high-powered ammo was the way to go. As a result, the initial Western answers to the AK-47 were larger, more powerful rifles that would best it in range, power, and accuracy, but have less ammo and controllability for fully automatic fire. The most famous examples are the Belgian FNFAL, the Spanish SETME, German HKG-3, and the American M14 and English L1A1 rifles, all of which fired the more powerful 7.62x5.1 round out of 20 round magazines. These styles of rifles proliferated across the third world, often signifying Cold War allegiances and conflict, a video that I actually plan on making at some point as well. But while the G3 and FAL fared well, and actually were used to some degree by smaller militaries to this day, the M14 failed to stack up to the AK under American service, a flaw that showed up most powerfully in the Vietnam War. It was during this conflict that a new generation of assault rifles would start. From here on out, the distinctions between generations are going to be much smaller, since changes within assault rifles will be a lot smaller than the invention of the assault rifle as such. Hence the semi-autos being Gen 0, because they're not really on this list. This Gen 2 really starts to bring an end to both the Gen 1 and 1A rifles in 1964, with the adoption of the M16 rifle by the US military. The different variants and the history of its adoption I won't go into here, but I will actually talk about that in my next video, so stay tuned for that. The Armalite style of rifle was different from an AK in that it used lightweight materials like aluminum and polymer rather than wood and steel. The AR-15 also used an intermediate cartridge, the 556x45, but the round was slimmer and had a higher velocity, marking a departure in the production process of the AK and STGs, which sought to simply shorten their existing ammo rather than change it entirely. The lightweight and smaller rounds made the guns easier to carry, but also allowed a soldier to carry more ammo, thus improving the chances of winning a firefight. These two factors brought in Gen 2, and these trends were adopted by many other militaries, including the Soviets. Early notable examples, of course, include the M16 and the AK-74, which used a narrower 5.45 round instead of the 7.62. The early AK-74s could also be considered somewhat of a transitional gun because of the wooden furniture, like a Gen 1.5, although this would change later, along with something like the AR-10, which uses a high caliber but light material. This generation really existed until the 1990s, and most militaries still used Gen 2 guns, 
Most service rifles you can think of fall in this category, the German G36, Israeli Galil, and the Swiss SG550. Later, a new, unique style of rifle came onto the scene in the form of the Bullpup, with the first of this new design, the Steyr AUG, being adopted in 1978 by Austria and later Australia. These rifles maintained the Gen 2 traits of small calibers and lighter materials, but significantly changed the style and operating system of the gun itself, with the main operations of the gun being behind the trigger, Bullpups are able to consolidate weapon functions closer to the shooter's body while also allowing for a longer barrel length in a rifle the same size as a conventional model, thereby increasing range, accuracy, and power. Therefore, while a very notable style, Bullpups didn't change the game in the same way as Armalite or Kalishnikovs did, and most countries never actually adopted Bullpups, still, the design was quite popular and other notable examples such as the French FAMAS, Chinese Type 95, and the English SA-80 are used by some of the most advanced fighting forces in the world. These bullpups make up Gen 2A. Then we have Gen 3, which really comes about in 1994. Gen 3 rifles are different from their predecessors with two main changes, shorter barrel length and increased modularity. While sacrificing stopping power at range, a shorter barrel makes guns more maneuverable and better for equipping suppressors, which lengthen guns considerably. The increased modularity of these rifles, usually with rail systems, allows for shooters to mount a variety of optics, lasers, lights, barrels, devices, and other furniture to their gun, not only allowing for a better shooting capability, but also allowing militaries to improve their weapon systems in a cheaper way than replacing the whole gun. The originator of this generation is the American M4 carbine, although the rifle has various predecessors like the Colt Commando that emphasized a shorter barrel. Many militaries have followed suit in moving to shorter or at least more modular rifles, with France and Germany adopting the carbine variants of the HK416, F, and A8 respectively, China moving to the QBZ191, and England looking to move to an Armalite-style carbine as well. The Russian AK-12 would be yet another borderline case here, as it is more modular but not shorter, although carbine variants certainly exist. This generation is not yet the status quo across the world, but it seems to be the direction that militaries are moving in for the last 30 years, faster now than in the past. The 2A category, of course, turns into the 3A, as weapons like the Israeli Tavor and Australian EF-88 get smaller and more modular. But recently, it seems that many countries are moving away from bullpups, and I suspect, this is obviously leaving history here, that the bullpup platform won't last that much longer. Israel and Australia and Austria seem to be sticking to their guns. Ha ha ha. But other militaries, namely China, England, and France, are moving away from the bullpup designs back to more conventional or Gen 3 rifles. I'll also note that the use of suppressors is getting more and more popular, and as a result, many guns are using adjustable gas blocks or piston systems to optimize that, although these traits have been around for a very long time, so I'm not sure that I would consider them a Gen 3 trait, but it is possible. Lastly, I want to look at what might be Gen 4 traits. Gen 4 is not really here yet, but earlier this year, the US Army decided to adopt the M5 rifle by Sig Sauer. While on the surface the gun looks pretty similar to some of the other guns, there are some significant changes that if they end up being fully adopted, and not just a fluke, will likely usher in the Gen 4 of assault rifles in this year, 2022. For one, the M5 is chambered in a high caliber 6.8 by 51 mm, much more similar to the Gen 1A designs. However, the rifle has the modularity, materials, and size of Gen 3 guns, and it's supposed to be used with a suppressor, so it wouldn't be safe to simply call it a regression. More drastic, the gun also uses a new type of composite shell ammunition to handle a much larger powder load, making up in part for the short barrel of the rifle. Ideally, these improvements would allow for better long-range engagements, as well as a better capability to pierce body armor in the event of a near-peer style war. A folding charging handle, adjustable gas system, and folding stock round out the upgrades, although all of these features are old news. I hesitate to officially make this part of the matrix, since again, it's super early and may just be one of those one-offs that go nowhere. 
Within the firearms community, the adoption of the M5 is generally seen as negative due to the rifle's weight, recoil, low capacity, and general regression and firefight thought that goes back to the world wars. Supporters of the new weapons say that the presence of body armor requires more power, and the advancement in optics will facilitate engagements at longer ranges, rendering modern wisdom of low caliber, high volume less accurate. But hey, we can't say for sure, maybe America's next war will be over long range areas against an advanced military, and the M5 will be great, or maybe it'll see action in an urban insurgency and just flop. I also want to quickly look at other past one-off innovations that, if adopted in a real way, could be considered Gen 4 traits. First off is hyperburst technology, where a gun fires two or three shots so fast that the shooter only experiences the recoil of one shot and is able to put that many rounds in the same place, greatly increasing lethality. The Russian AN-94 is perhaps the most notable version of this, although this function doesn't actually seem to work as the recoil from the first round still offsets the gun, thus making it just a really lame full auto. Caseless cartridges were tried in the 1990s with the HKG-11, which also had a hyperburst setting, but this also went nowhere, as did gyrojet guns, which used compressed air to fire bullets. Quick change barrels and calibers were also looked into by the Magpul Masada in the early 2000s, although this too went nowhere, as it turns out quickly changing ammo wasn't too big a priority for the US since that would mean having to store multiple kinds of rifle ammo, which is a logistic nightmare. Integrally suppressed weapons exist on the American civilian market and across the world, like the AS Val and Maxim 9 pistol, although these haven't really been picked up too much either. The other entries for the NGSW program that competed against the M5 are also quite futuristic. Texaco submission introduced a telescoping polymer ammo, an elevator style feeding, an ejection system, and even a stabilizing attachment to assist in accurate aiming. General Dynamics bullpup design brought in polymer shelled ammo, a smaller suppressor system, and a reciprocating barrel to decrease recoil. The M5 was easily the most conservative of these designs, and it's really no surprise that SIG won just looking at military history. So in short, here's a quick rundown of the chart. Gen Zero guns are semi-auto rifles that were used mostly in World War II. Soon after World War II, Gen 1 assault rifles come out in full force with the AK-47, although earlier developments occurred during the war with the STG-44. These rifles are shorter, lighter, and use an intermediate caliber and are select fire that allow for submachine gun and rifle capabilities in one weapon. Soon after, Gen 1A rifles, mostly produced in Western countries, appear but still use full power ammunition instead of intermediate calibers. This changed in 1964 with the introduction of the AR-15 or M16 style rifles, which used lighter materials and more specialized, narrower ammo to increase velocity and effectiveness of the smaller round. About 15 years later, bullpup rifles keep the core traits of Gen 2 rifles, but fundamentally change the shape and style of the rifle, creating a Gen 2A category that was also quite popular at the same time as the more conventional rifles. 30 years later, the United States changes the game again with the introduction of the M4, a shorter, more modular weapon that slowly phases out its predecessor and inspires other designs, including many replacements to previously bullpup using countries, although 3A rifles live on. Gen 4 is not yet known, but the most likely candidate to usher in this new generation, the M5, has been adopted by the US Army in 2022 and features a return of high-powered ammo and change in ammo style but retains many of the features of Gen 3, emphasizing other attachments like smart optics and suppressors. So that's it for this chart, everyone, and this video. Hope you enjoyed. Let me know what you think. I think this is a pretty good matrix. Uh, although I don't think it's perfect, mainly we can see the Kalashnikovs don't perfectly fit into it as they pretty much monopolize Gen 1 and then serve as border cases between the other generations. Maybe they deserve their own matrix, but anyway, hope everyone enjoyed. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell for more content. Hope all of you are doing great and I will see you in the next one. Goodbye.